Okay, this is chapter 13, Vulnerability Assessment and Data Security. Everything seems to be working fine. It talks about accessing a security posture. Okay, first of all, there's lots of vulnerabilities in this chapter. We're going to talk about some of the tools with them. We're going to talk about some of the risk involved and that kind of stuff. Okay, um, some of you have seen a lot of this before, but you know, some of you have not. Okay, they really talk about examining you're evaluating your posture, and they talk about you know, the asset identification, threat evaluation. We're gonna walk through each one of these things here in the next couple slides, okay? Um, before we get there, though, let's, let's just look at it real quick. Asset identification, what's an asset? Anybody know? Example of an asset? Something of value. Something of value. I mean, a prime example is our phone. We all have phones nowadays. I was on a uh, cruise ship what, a couple weeks ago, and I went to use a restroom, and somebody left a cell phone and glasses in there. Man, that guy came running back in there so, so quick. I'm like, let me guess, you're looking for a cell phone and glasses. But uh, yeah, an asset is basically anything of value to me. Okay. Um, like here at Rose, I, I guess there's nothing I can show you, but a lot of the items here have asset tags on them because they're valuable. Rose State tags stuff over $500, and there's got to be something you can tag on it. That, should have a tag. I don't know, but there's tags on some of these. What? Maybe yeah, maybe, yeah, yeah, probably. But they put them with, okay, it's on the back, but there should be one on his elbow as well. Oh, there it is, it's right, right on the front, yeah. So there are tags on certain things. Yeah, speaking of that, I don't know where you all work. Alex, I know you work, is it, what is it? Okay, do you guys tag assets as well? Do you know? They don't physically tag anything? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Like uh, back when I ran my business, obviously I didn't tag anything, neither did my customers, but I still have to keep track of it. But here at Rose, we only tag stuff with value of $500 or more. I still think that policy is kind of weird because there's a lot of stuff of value that's less than $500. Okay. Um, the new cell phone, the Galaxy Fold, y'all hear the news on that one? They're all cracking even before they're releasing them. I think it's over two thousand dollars. It's just under two thousand dollars. It's like wow. Why would you? It's not looking good. Not looking good. They had the they had the exploding phone. Now they got the breaking bending phone. And I don't know. But I also saw another video of a uh, Tesla. Was it in uh, Australia? It was in somewhere. Just in a parking lot. Garage just caught fire. Just, if you think about it, batteries explode. Yeah, okay. I mean, it's, it's yeah. in Australia, it's pretty hot. Yeah, but uh, I was actually, we have a cabinet above my dryer. I don't know, y'all probably have cabinet, just throw stuff in there. Well, I've been putting stuff in this cabinet for about 19 years. And there was some batteries in there. <laughs> wow, they were two D cell batteries. They were so huge. The bottoms had kind of ballooned out, looked like they had donuts on the bottom, all this, all the acid, and I'm like, oh, so I was in there scraping the bottom. So I just keep throwing stuff in the cabinet, stuff gets pushed to the back, and then, oh, it's crazy. But yeah, asset is, is a big deal. Okay, so talk about assets. They talk about people. People are also an asset. Like McDonald's has a 600% turnover rate. Kind of sucks for training, but they are still an asset. Um, Physical assets, data could be an asset. Um, now I've read a whole bunch of books and they're talking about all these companies like um, Uber, Uber and Lyft. You know Uber and Lyft are. Neither one of them are making money yet, yet they're still valued at millions of dollars. How could they do that? And even when Google first started out, Google was making zero money if they were valued at millions of dollars based on the potential of making money at some point, okay? But Uber and Lyft, I mean, Uber's deal is now that they're so popular, they're trying to bring out the more of the Uber Eats and stuff like that. Before long, I guess if you want something at Walmart, you'd just be able to call an Uber to get something at Walmart for you. I mean, it's a good deal. I mean, Walmart has delivery now for groceries. Yeah, delivery in this yeah. area? Oh, wow, I didn't know they had delivery in this area. I know they had pickup in this yeah, area. Yeah, they had pickup, and I think in some cases they have delivery. Like, but I know I, my mom had to some groceries to our house for some time. I was like, oh, that stuff at home too. It's gonna happen. Delivery well, by Postmates. Oh, now, okay, what, what exactly is Postmates? Is it just someone who picks it up and then delivers stuff to you from where, any store? 
I don't know about any store, but I know they do it from Walmart. Yeah. Now, I saw DoorDash. DoorDash is popular for restaurants now. But I, I live at I-40 and Chalkout Road. There is nothing to deliver there. And uh, we, we had a deal with Pizza Hut, the D Pizza Hut on Douglas, had a deal that they would deliver to us for one month on Mondays only. And if they got in a business, that only lasted two weeks and they quit. It's like, damn. But uh, still, as of yesterday, no one still delivers to me. It sucks. I just knew DoorDash would, but no. But okay, so, so data is a big deal. But uh, here, we have student records. I wouldn't consider that data. I mean, it is, but it's nothing we would sell. But a lot of places do sell data and they consider assets, like I said, Uber and stuff like that. Hardware, software, all that could be an asset and you buy something. But one thing a lot of places don't link into, like I'm in charge of all the assets here in this building. And, you know, some of the stuff is so old. We have a laptop that I think was issued to me back in 2004. Still have it. What's the value of that laptop at this point? It's probably very low, baby. But if you look the, in, our, in our inventory, it's probably valued very high. So, you know, a lot of times you got to think about it, if something gets stolen. How about the, the trial building, you know, on 15th Street right in front of Rose State? Y'all see the, the new sign on the trial building? The Epic Charter School now? I guess they're renting the entire building from us or something, or at least a good portion of the building. So. Oh, is that why there was an email for the parking lot being closed? There was a there's a parking lot that's close today. Oh. Oh, okay. There's going to be a a grand opening for the new printer thing over there tomorrow. But uh, but you know, it's, it's so hardware, software, physical assets, you know, buildings. And we applied for a million dollar grant, and they actually came out last week. And did an actual appraisal of this building to see the value of it because it looks like we are getting the million dollar grant. And all, it also looks that Cox is going to give us additional funding. So this might be called the Cox Communication Cybersecurity Center at Rose State College. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, uh, all the cybersecurity places I know about in Texas, the schools I work with, they're all sponsored by Chevron. Yes, the Chevron Cybersecurity Lab and stuff like that. And I used to take care of the computers at the Marriott. Y'all know where the Marriott is? Not Marriott Gardens. The Marriott, the Cox Communicate, Cox Center used to be the Marriott. That was the name. You know about that. And then literally while I was taking care of the computers is when Cox signed the deal with them, put the name on the building. And it was crazy. They just brought in all this infrastructure equipment and goes, here you go. And it's like, wow. You know, it was and all their internet became free and everything else, and then they could actually start charging for it, which is kind of a good deal. But there's a lot of things that can be considered an asset. How about a contract with a company? Would that be an asset? Yeah, that's yeah. financial. Yeah, it does. That's financial. I would think that would be of an asset as well. So it's after inventory has been taken, support to determine each item's relative value. And again, this is the thing I mentioned a second ago, value changes. Yeah, I bought a whole bunch of um, porcelain floor tile for my house. I just redid my whole house, basically. I bought 420 square feet of it for like you know, $1,300. And I had 67 of them left. And I also bought five ceiling fans, and I had two left I didn't use. And I was worried if I brought them back to Lowe's, Lowe's might say, hey, you know, it's been six months. We're not going to take them. Or they might try to assign a new value to them, but I was surprised they actually gave it to me. You know, took them back for the exact thing I paid for them, which was kind of good. And then after I left, I was thinking, wait, what happens if the ceiling fan costs more now? You know, they're going to up the price and sell it to somebody else at a higher rate. You know, but valuing assets is a big deal because things change, especially in IT. I would say they always go down for the most yeah. part. Yeah. That's how Change so frequently, so they're always going down. So it's factors to consider. How critical is the asset to the goal of the organization? Okay, it's very important. Obviously, it has a higher value to us. Okay, how much revenue does it generate? How difficult it is to replace? Now let's talk about replacing for a second. Uh, back when I took care of Sergeant Grit, the, the Marine guy, his place, uh, they talked. We talked him into buying an additional switch. For a backup, what do you think? Is that a good plan? 
we, we did use it at a couple different times with different ones Burnett. And, and at one point, we finally talked to them into buying two of them. Thank God we did, because we actually had two go down at one time. So, but the point is, how many do you buy? You know, we did the, uh, last week, uh, we submitted the um, hardware requests or the technology request for the next fiscal year. William always puts in, you know, spare PCs, spare this, spare that, and the next thing. I'm always wondering when actually service can say, wait, but that's too many. Now, what would be, now if we got 400 computers in this building, what do you think you could not have spared? Uh, 100 is way too much. That means one out of every four is going to die. I think we have 10 spares, which I think is fine. But I'm always worried they're going to say, wait a minute, why do you want 10 spares? But we need it. Because you can imagine if this computer went out right now, it'd be hard to teach class with no computer. But yeah, replacement, that kind of stuff is kind of a big deal. And here they talk about some you know, given numeric value with five being extremely valuable, one being least value. Okay. Threat evaluation says list potential threats that come from given or threat agents. So what can happen? Well, one of the questions they asked when they were appraising this building was water damage. Well, we have had some water damage from leakage of the roof. You know, that's been pretty much fixed. But really, you know, water damage, I would say, is a minimal impact here. But theft, we've actually had quite a bit of theft. Somebody went through the whole darn campus and was stealing all the projectors. Somebody went up in room 203 years ago and sold all the CPUs. Literally opened the cases and pulled all the processors out. So just, I mean, we had a, a, a container of 10 laptop that stole. They just took them all. So, you know, that can happen. So it says, a threat agent is any person or thing with the power to carry out a threat against an asset. So someone could steal something. Like we try to leave a lot of rooms here locked, but consider this room is really a lecture room. It's not that big a deal, but it does still have a computer in it and a phone in it, okay? Threat modeling says goals of understanding attackers and their methods. What could people possibly do? Um, were you all here? Anyone here Tuesday, was it last week when we had the active shooter thing? Where they came in and started banging on all the doors. I guess upstairs they were trying to deliver pizzas. They're trying to get some people to open the door saying, pizza delivery, and then they're going to pretend they were going to shoot them. So crazy <laughs> stuff. But uh, pizza. I guess uh, Adam was teaching, and we'd already lost a couple Tuesdays, and he was right in the middle of giving a test, and he's like, get out. And, and they're like, you're dead. He goes, I don't care. Get out. We're giving a test. <laughs> yeah. What got me, though, was when they said an exercise. Exercise you don't always participate in. You know? Oh, no, they called it a drill. It was a drill. Heck, I was just on a cruise ship. They had a drill both weeks I was on there. I didn't participate in either one of the drills. So I just thought it was misleading whether I had to participate or not. But oh, well. The threat modeling, big deal. And how about attack trees? So visual representation of attack scenario, which we'll see a picture of here in a second. Okay, I should look at both of those in just a second. And here's some of the threats. Natural disasters, fire, you know, um, tornado. We've had a tornado here. Took out half the communication center. A tornado went through my neighborhood. It literally took entire houses off their foundation and got rid of them. It knocked over, I think, one panel in my fence. I was like, that's the bizarre thing. It literally didn't touch my yard, yet totally took out other houses. Okay, intellectual prop property, property, pirated software, that kind of stuff. Espionage, extortion, hardware failure, human error, you know, sabotage, you know, uh, software attacks, just all kinds of stuff. Theft, uh, utility interruption, electrical power failure, just lots of stuff that could happen. Okay. All right, here's our tree. So we have a, a steal a car stereo. What, can, what ways could we steal? We could break the glass, we could steal the key, we could carjack. So we stole the key. How are we going to get the key? Well, we could grab the purse, we can make a copy. And you know, from there, we can you know, threaten the agent or blackmail the attendant or bribe the attendant. So different ways we could do it, all leading up to stealing a car stereo. Is it important? For all instances, no, but depending on your organization, it could be. Okay, here's another example. Log into a restricted account. Well, we could learn the password. How could we learn it? 
can find it written down, or could get it from a person, or could do with a key logger or shoulder surfer. And they're only breaking out a couple of me. They all would be broken out at the point. So just different ways it could happen. You do these so that you, it helps you figure out all the threats and all the vulnerabilities against, in this, in this case, an account. Okay. All right, vulnerability presence is determine current weaknesses. Again, that stuff can change. So we got doors in this room. Is the door currently locked? I don't know. Um, we had, uh, what was it, man, about a couple of years, maybe four years ago now. Okay. Somebody, back in the old cyber lines, we had a bookshelf in the back where I had all these leftover textbooks that would check out to grant students. Someone went in and stole them all. Well, we figured out they had, they were doing is this guy was cleaning the building with a backpack on, it was empty. He'd walk in that room and he'd leave with it full. Then he'd come back through this hallway and he'd be in this room for two or three hours each day. What he was doing was he was going out the door, hopping in his car, driving home, coming back for quitting time. So he was not only stealing books, but he was stealing time. He was, who knows what else he was stealing, okay? So that door could be a weakness. Okay. Take a snapshot of current organizational security. Okay, it says every asset should be viewed in light of each threat. So if I was worried about you know, a flood, maybe this computer is not that big a deal, but an electrical interruption, theft, all that kind of stuff would be more of a, you know, a threat to this. Okay. And catalog each vulnerability. Okay. Risk assessment. I think it's, what's in this document? Is it 800-34? Does anyone know? Yeah, that, sounds, that sounds right. I think it actually looks like, if you've never looked that uh, kind of stuff up. Yeah, this has been. Yeah. See, I think SP-34, let's see. 800-34. Eight, oh, duh, yeah, good point. No, I was missing something. Contingency planning, then what's risk? Uh, yes. What's the number? What's the document? SP... 37? Ah, uh, it's changed. Well, maybe it is, who knows. But SP 37, or 800 S 37 oh, is one. 800 S 30 is died for conducting risk assessment. Oh, it is 30, okay, so 30. But there's obviously some changes to it from there. But risk assessment is looking at everything. It says, uh, determine damage that could result from an attack. Back when I was going to school, we had to do a risk assessment against ourselves, like some things that could happen to us. You know, I, I'm in, uh, I have a risk every morning of driving here, so that's because of the darn construction zone and I believe. And some of you probably have worse traffic going from other places. But different risks, you know, what can happen from an attack, it does change, how likely is it to happen to your organization, all that kind of stuff, okay. So it could be no impact, it could be a small impact, or it could be catastrophic. So if we lose electrical power, what, what level of risk do you think that would be? No impact, significant, major. I would say if it's just maybe for one day, even, maybe it's a major impact, but we could probably go with a day. Yeah. But what if we lost it for a week? And that, was, that, would, yeah, that would be probably catastrophic because we, that would be maybe not catastrophic at that point. We lost it for an extended period of time because yeah. we've been out of school for a week before. Yeah. But if we went more than a week, I could see that becoming an issue. But what if, you know, when enrollment was going on and we couldn't enroll people or we couldn't publish grades or what a lot of people don't think about, what if we couldn't rate paychecks? How long do you think the people at Rose State would keep working if there was no paychecks? Not very long. Well, we only get paid once a month. But I guarantee if we missed that one monthly paycheck, some people yeah. would be. Yeah. So like max a month. Yeah. So, I mean, let's have the government shut down. Everyone's freaking out. No money, but how long was the shutdown this time? Like a hundred days. It was a very, it was a very long. Very long. long. Was but you right know, all the government employees get all their back pay. Yeah. So they did have to go to work for that time period. A lot of them did. Well, a lot. Some of them. Okay. I Critical have positions had to go to work. Yeah. But not everybody had. So a friend of mine works at the FAA. She was not allowed to go to work. But when it finally got done, guess what? They paid her back pay as if she worked every single day. Uh, but a lot of people had trouble. 
surviving that. Oh, definitely, that. definitely. If you're out, you know, out a long period of time, and you know, and if you live paycheck to paycheck, which a lot of people do, but I know none of you do. Don't do that, do you? <laughs> but we should not do that, by the way, if you don't know that. But you're right. A lot of people, you know, that could be a catastrophic event, not getting a paycheck for 90 days or however many days it ends up being. But they all got their money back. That's all. I'd be like, sweet. I mean, I get three months off without pay and then get paid for it later. Okay. Risk mitigations. So determine what to do about risk. How are we going to handle it? Okay. And how much of risk can be tolerated? Y'all have insurance, I'm assuming. Car insurance, home insurance, crazy expensive stuff. That's kind of like a risk tolerance there is how much, you know, so when you're looking at home, or, well, let's go to car insurance because we all should have that. What's your deductible? Is your deductible low or high? You know, I have full coverage insurance on my car. Do I need full coverage insurance? No, because it's paid off. But I have full coverage insurance, that way if it gets wrecked, it's going to be replaced. But the question is, what if I couldn't afford that? I, then I could get, you know, I could have lowered, you know, my payments, in other words, raised my deductible, you know, it's, you know tolerated differently. So, so identify it, identify the threat, the vulnerability, assess the risk, and then mitigation, decide what to do with the risk. Another prime thing is we have about seven to 10,000 random people in this building area or in this campus, all of you students. That's a big risk, because you could be bad people, or you know, you could hurt yourselves. We were talking, I was talking to Arlene just before class. She got a, a slash in her tire somehow, and they had to go to her tire place. Now she pays 25 bucks for the warranty, you know, uh, the warranties in case, in case of road hazards. But she just went and picked up her car today and she was talking to the guy. She says, oh yeah, they had people that come in and all of a sudden all four tires were slashed right when they were near the end of the warranty. So what they do, they give me brand new tires for 25 bucks. Not a bad deal. Is it you know, the proper thing to do? No, but you know, that's what she took, that's what she does, you know, the, the warranty there. So, okay, now let's talk about some of the tools, port scanners, protocol analyzers, just a bunch of different ones. We're gonna go through quite a few of these. Okay, TCP IP, that's the protocol suite we use to connect to the internet, connect to a network, connect to each other. So this involves information exchange between one systems programs and another one, uses a numeric value identifier for a port number. That's a 16-bit number, okay? The port number is a unique address or unique number to a specific service. Here they list some of the ports, 0 to 1023 are the well-known ports. Now, 1024 to 49,000 are the registered port numbers. Then you see we have dynamic ones after that. Now my question is, can we change ports? Yeah. Yes, you can. For instance, uh, RDP uses, anybody? 3389. Okay, RDP uses 3389. But what if my organization blocks 3389, but they don't block 25? Could I change it to work on 25? I surely could, because I did that for years. And a good thing about doing, okay, good and bad. <laughs> a good thing is you can possibly get, a, get through some security measures that way. But a bad thing is if you can get through, something else can do. So it could be a bad thing as well. So those are, this is the well-known port numbers, but you can, you know, port map stuff into different ports, okay. So this knowledge of what port is being used is kind of important, especially for a specific service. And we're going to look at an example of that. There are port scanners out there that can tell if it's open, closed, blocked, or uh, what's the other one? Open, closed, blocked, or filtered. I don't know. Can't even see it. What's the name for Stealth. Stealth. Good thing of the name. Yeah. Um, uh, here, let me show you this website. Have you never been to this website? Actually, didn't I? Did we talk about GRC in this class? Or was that the other class? I've seen it in several classes. Okay, we're going to show you now. If you've never seen this, you need to go here. Go to GRC, Gibson Research Corporation, and there's a link here called Shields Up. Go there, and then cruise on down to where Shields Up, right here. 
What this will do is it will scan from the internet to your computer. And it's trying to, it's testing vulnerabilities on your machine through the internet. And if it does good, it'll basically say everything's closed. Okay, let's just do, we'll do come, I'll do common ports. Okay, so what it's trying to do now is it's scanning my computer from the internet. And we have stealth analysis, which means every single port is closed, which is a good thing. If you do this from your house and it shows you have ports open, that's a problem. Okay, that means someone can get in. Our firewall basically blocks everything. Okay, that's why nothing is available on this connection. What's cool about this is they do tell you how to fix them. Uh, we could we could do all service ports. I don't know how long that would take. Now let's see. It might take longer. Yeah, but if you've never gone to this website, I recommend going to it. It's really cool. And try it from your house, and then you'll see if you have any ports open that's inbound into your system at home. He's not installing spyware, malware, or viruses. He's just trying to break in. I've never tried it on a mobile phone. I don't know what it'll do. But try it on your phone if it works on your phone. GRC.com, then go to Shields Up. Try and test it on Wi-Fi or on LCD. Wi-Fi is probably blocked. But probably going to be the same thing as you're saying. Yeah, you'll be on 10 instead of 12. But it'll probably be the same thing. So let's check all. I'm going to stop this thing. This can take forever. I don't think there is a way to stop it. There we go. Okay. So it will scan every port if you do like I just did. But kind of cool. So if you've never done that, Please do. It's really interesting stuff. And Quinn's checking it out to see if we have any. We'll be LTE see if he gets anything. Okay. Uh, it's, it's fast. All stealth. All stealth? Yeah. I'm on LTE? LTE? Good. Okay. All right. Now, here is a picture of a port scanner. This is Advanced Port Scanner 1.3 by the same company who made our admin, which software I used to use. Um, I went today and looked, and there's a new version out there, 2.5.3.36.80. This is what it looks like. And you are welcome. I put it up on the web. I put it up in the module if you want to try it. And I'm going to do it right now just so you can show it. This is it right here. I'm going to run this as administrator. English only, and I think this one will have a portable version. So I could run it right here without installing it. I'm going to agree to this. And it's instructing some files, and it should run. Now, it defaults. Let's see a new version. Seriously, I literally downloaded this today. <laughs> and there's already a new version available. Wow. Well, I guess that means they're working on it. That's craziness. Okay. I'm going to scan right now. Now, the problem is I'm scanning. Well, I'm actually scanning a very large network. Okay. Yeah, I'm not going to let this scan for very long because it could take forever. Let's get a cost. Well, well, it's going quicker than I thought. Come on. Don't worry. IT service is probably yelling at me. What are you doing on the network? Okay. But this is actually, if you click on these, you'll actually see what it finds. And it actually gives you to you in somewhat English, which is kind of nice. Okay. So, so like a Windows and that. Yep, exactly. There's a Dell machine. A lot of machines with closed ports. Yeah, 135. So that one has some stuff open. Some of them do. Oh, there's that printer. Remember that printer we looked at? Oh, we looked at it in the other class. Yeah, that was the other class. That's fixed, by the way. Oh, good. I told them about that. It was funny. What we're referring to is we uh, we scanned this. We actually got into this printer remotely in the other class and found out no one had put a password on the admin interface. So I told them about it. You know what they told me? Oh, those are on every single, you know, basically we changed the password and all this stuff and every one of them. We must have missed that one. The one I checked you missed? Yeah. So I wonder if they went and checked the rest. But that's kind of cool. It tells us it's a printer. 
and it's got SSL enabled and so on and so forth. And I'm going to stop this thing. It's done enough. But it's you know, kind of a cool tool. It tells you what it can, and it's not going to. Oh, this one had a bunch. Aha. BS208 deploy. Look at all that stuff there. Now, I will tell you that we're logged in as me. My account does have more access than some. That's why I can see all those folders. You wouldn't be able to see those from the classroom. Why is that like where um, you have the. That's where William upstairs could like re image this machine. Yeah, that's what I thought. But he, I'm in a special group that have access to certain. You as a student would not see all those. Yeah, but, yeah. Right. Kind of a cool little tool there, this advanced port scanner. They have changed it quite a bit. I mean, if you look at the picture, that's what it used to look like. To tell you the truth, I like the old look better, but I think the new one gives you know, a little bit more information. Yeah. All right, so that's Advanced Sports Scanner. Protocol Analyzers is hardware software that captures packets, T decode, that means to decode, and analyze contents, also known as sniffers. can also be used to do a lot of stuff on the network. And here's a picture of Wireshark. I don't know the version of this one. So I went ahead and downloaded Wireshark Portable, and there's a picture of that. I put it up there as well. I'm going to run it two different ways. I'm just going to run this, okay? Just open and run it. I'm going to say English, and this is the Portable Edition, so it's not really going to install much. It's installing it into memory, and it shouldn't take that long in theory. Okay, now I'm going to run it. Finish. Now there's two different things I want to show you here. See if this one does it. Wow, oh, it's okay. I didn't expect it to do it this way. Normally, if you just run it without admin permissions, you do not get local connection. What you'll get is you'll get these bottom four. You'll get the random packet generator, which I think is kind of cool. It literally just generates random packets, and you can, it's kind of like you're testing it, okay? But if I go up here to local area connection, you can see I'm getting some traffic on there. So I can click on this. Yeah, and it's probably all the Zoom traffic. There's quite a bit of it going on there. Yes. Yeah. Now I'm going to stop this. I stopped it. I bet there are some other, let's sort by protocol, see if we can get something different here somewhere. Okay, I got a little bit of UDP stuff going on. I really don't know what that is for me to broadcast. I don't know what I'm doing with that. But there's quite a bit of traffic. And again, most of this is Zoom. I bet if we were to look at this destination of 162, actually, let's find out where that is. NS, look up, 162. Look up. 162.255.38.98. Zoom, whatever, dot zoom, dot us. So we were correct. That is definitely Zoom. That's the live streamer Zoom we're doing. So again, I ran it without running as admin. I was surprised it gave me the ability to do local, uh, local connection a lot. Oh, you know why? This is an old machine. This is Windows 7. Windows 10, you got to do run as admin. That's why I ran it earlier. So if you run it with just opening it on Windows 7, you're fine. But on Windows 10, you will not have access to the local connections. You'll need to run that as an administrator. That's why I totally forgot about that. So that's what Wireshark Portable looks like. Uh, you can install it as well. We use it for a lot of stuff in a lot of different classes. Really cool tool. Okay. Vulnerability scanners. There's lots of them out there that actually go out and look for vulnerabilities. And there's active scanners and passive scanners. I keep thinking of Hunt for Red October when I hear about active and passive. Active sends probes out looking for stuff. Passive just listens. Okay, mainly says, you can identify the current software, the application be used on a network can indicate what they are, but it doesn't send a probe out, so it's not always as accurate. Okay. And what can they be this is alert when new systems are added to the network. Um, I use a system in my house called Eros. Let me show you what Eros is. Okay. I use Eros now. That's the current 
router I have in my house, and I really it works really well. And it's funny, I told Terry Byers out. He bought one. He's like, oh, my God, it's the coolest router on the man. What I like about it is it notifies me. Hey, there's a new device on your network. And even if I'm at work, it will send me a notification to my phone tell me there's a new device on my network, which is kind of cool. So I'm very pleased with that device at this point. So detect an application is compromised. Detect the internal system begins to port scan other systems. And not all do this, but some do. And it also depends on what agents are installed. You can track software, you can track vulnerabilities, all kinds of detail. No, another slide, we'll see the names of them. Okay, there's mapping scanner, there's wireless scanners, there's all kinds of different scanners out there we can use. And they talk about, I think this one's Nessus. This is Tenable, which is Nessus, isn't it? Yeah. Should be, yes. Looks like Nessus. Yeah, the picture's just really bad. I just, I did not install this to get a better picture. But NASA's really popular one. You can get a copy for free. You can get it just by your student email address. Now, what now? It's a trial copy. Yes, it still works. No, it actually works. It is unlimited time now, isn't it? Um, well, I used it for uh, one of the labs for another classes. Oh, wow. Well, who knows? They're always changing stuff. Okay. Honeypot this is a computer protected by minimal security. Basically, what you do is you get a machine set up that looks vulnerable so that people would attack it rather than your other resources. You can use it, you know, like it says here, it contains bogus data, can be used to determine what they're doing and then try to break into it. So there's also a honey net, which is a network, a vulnerable network set up that you can watch attackers attack, okay? There's an example, you can actually see what's happening. You can see someone's connected with whatever, doing whatever, and hopefully attacking that rather than your regular system, okay? Banner grabbing tools. Here's a, I know you've seen some of these already. Here's an example of a banner. WL, I connected to an FTP site for McAfee. I can already tell they're running SP FTP 1.0. Okay, so I grab the banner. You can also do the same thing for websites. We just don't have Telnet installed here, do we? Oh, we do. Quit. Quit. Okay, let's go. Did I do it? Sometimes you can do that and it will show you the banner. There it goes. Okay. Uh, it tells me they're running Microsoft. H this is Rose State's website, by the way. They're running Microsoft HTTP API 2.0 and it has the data of the server. And you know, so it tells me. Error message. Yeah. Let me see. Who do we know? Anybody running an Apache server? By the way, the way I did that was I connected to on port eighty to the web with with Telnet, so it did not display the web page. So it was going to error out, and sometimes it'll show you a banner. Who who would be running Apache? Anybody? Linux should be. Okay, they're running a Cloudflare server. That's probably a version of Linux. Okay, but um, that's basically what a banner is. What is Cloudflare? I never heard of it. Let's find out. The official site, speed up and protect your sites. So, yeah, I just went to Linux.org, so I didn't even know what site I was connected to. But it's just a banner. It says a message that a service transmits when another program connects to it, trying to tell us what service it is, what they offer, stuff like that. And there you can do banner grabbing, intentionally grabbing those banners to see what services are. Okay, crackers. This is the thing you break or crack the security of a system. They talk about wireless crackers as breaking the Wi-Fi. And if you have web, for instance, I think that takes a whole five seconds to break now. They talk about password crackers. I, I listed a few here. Off crack, lock crack, John the Ripper, Kane, there's lots of them out there. Um, they all work good, they all work bad. You, know, it's, you need to know them all. John the Ripper is probably the most popular for the. Yeah, and lock crack was actually very popular. Then it was bought out by Symantec. Then they sold it back to the guys who originally wrote it. 
So it's actually a really super easy to use tool. Let's let's find out if it's if you can even download it. We used a cane for the Metasploit lab in Security. Yeah. And Windows 10 really did not want to install that. Yeah, it, it does. Windows was like 100 percent sure it was not working. Yeah, it sucks because it's called a privilege escalation tool. Yeah, see so here's Love Crack. See Reborn in 2009 as LC6. So could we download it if we wanted to? Watch video, free trial. Oh, Lockcraft 7's out. Yeah, it's good right here. So. That was a really, really good tool years ago. I don't, again, I haven't used it in a while, but it was probably one of the best, because you could go in there and you could say, do dictionary attack, do hybrid attack, do brute force attack with you know, just letters or letters you know, lowercase and uppercase or with numbers or with special characters. It just had all kinds of stuff. And it could also, cap, depending on the one, again, I don't know if it still does it, you could capture password hashes across the network, you could also import the same file from your machine. So it did have a lot of functionality there at one point. And I haven't looked at it lately. So. But a lot of different cracking tools out there. There's a lot of command line tools. Ping, Netstat, Trashout. We're not going to look all these up. But we've actually used many over time. Okay. IP config, IF config, and IP and TCP dump. Just lots of different tools you can use. And a lot of these are listed on the Security Plus exam. So, yeah, you just need to know what they are. Just play with them. I mean, every, okay, maybe not everyone. I don't think you can type dig on Windows. Yeah, that's Pretty sure you can't type dig. Yeah, I didn't think you could. But you could really type the rest of them. Yeah, I can see what my ARP cache is. And TCP dump you'd have to install. But, you know, it's just, it's kind of like Wireshark. But there is, there's also called WinDump is the Windows version, again, which is not installed here. But there's just lots of them available to us, okay? Uh, Nmap, Network Mapper, Netcat, a command line, an alternative. There's just lots of different tools out there, and you just need to play with them. And if you don't play with them, you're never going to get good at them. And I will tell you, if you go to the IT Pro TV website, they have videos of every tool, every one. Hours and hours, like hundreds and hundreds of hours of videos up there. So it's really cool stuff. Okay, other tools. They start talking about steganography. It's funny because I actually went here today to verify the address, and I typed in stego archive. I just typed in like that. I'm like, oh, stegoarchive.com looks legit, doesn't it? But you go here, and it's like, hey, we shouldn't be going here. It's like, that's four redirects. Oh, yeah, now we're going to Kelly Blue Book. So obviously, that's not good. <laughs> okay. Four redirects. So the what I did was I put on here, don't go to stegoarchive.com. <laughs> you can go to there. But it used to be stegoarchive.org, and I guess it, that website's gone or something. But there's a lot of steganography tools out there, and you'll use those in forensics whenever you get to that point. You know, some of you are already there. Okay. It's basically a way of hiding data in images or in other audio files, video files, executable, stuff like that. So kind of a cool project we do there. Um, uh, vulnerability scanner. There's a lot of automated scanners out there. I use one called LandGuard. It was by GFI at one point. Let's see if it's still there. It was on, yep, still is from LandGuard, from GFI LandGuard. A really good tool, what was good about, I actually owned a uh, commercial version of it because I used it with my company. And you could scan your network and it would find vulnerabilities like in Windows updates missing. It'll go ahead and install them for you. So you can literally click install, 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 install. So you literally could update your whole domain all from one computer. So very, very nice tool. It is not, not that expensive, but it does cost. Um, I don't know. I don't know if the license model is still that way, but it was at one point. You paid by the number of hosts that scan at one time. So you know, if you got your domain, it's got, I think I I paid for fifty hosts. But if you tried to use it on more than that, it wouldn't work. So, but a lot of cools out. A lot of cools. 
um, they identify vulnerabilities, they identify weaknesses, they can update them, they can make recommendations. They made really nice reports, so I used to use them quite a bit, but I don't do that anymore. Okay. Okay, two methods. There's intrusive vulnerability scan. It's attempts to actually penetrate the system to perform a simulated attack, or non-intrusive, don't quite do it. Okay. Uh, I know Dr. Schnoy's people recently, probably within the last two years, were brought in to break into the 911 phone system up in New England. And as proof of concept, they changed the backgrounds on all the machines to the University of Tulsa logo. Because they didn't want to do anything to cause harm, but they needed proof that they actually got into the systems. And the way they got in was through the help app in their phone system. Uh, it didn't do something right, and they went into the help app, they went to open a file, they were open to, able to open an executable, and I think they were able to open the command line, and that's it, they were in the system, and so it's funny type stuff. Okay. All right, and credentialed vulnerability scan provides credentials using a password to a scanner. That's what I would use on a network, especially when I want to look for vulnerabilities. I would provide a domain admin account. That way, you can actually do a good scan of each machine and look for vulnerabilities. Just like I showed you with another one, you saw shares available just because of the admin account I'm running. Without that, you wouldn't have seen those. Okay. It says penetration testing also is designed to exploit weaknesses. They rely on your skill, your knowledge, and your cunning. Usually conducted by an independent contractor. There's lots of them out there that do it. There's actually a lot of TV shows of people who do it. Usually conduct um, conducted outside, and you write a report. And they go, here's the three different types. Black box it says you have no prior knowledge of network infrastructure, so you know nothing about it. White box, you know a lot about it. Gray box, you might know some about it, okay? And you can have active, which is involves actively probing the systems, or passive, where you use tools, but you don't really do anything to cause the problems, okay? And there's one more thing they mention in here somewhere. Where's it at? Okay, once you've gained information, the next step is perform the initial exploitation, or tell someone about it, depending on the system you're on. And you attempt to perform a pivot, an example of that would be, okay, I have a home security camera. What if there was a vulnerability in the security camera that you could break into the security camera? Camera. Well, the camera is connected to my internal network. So if you get into the camera, then you could pivot from the camera into the internal network. Make sense? Kind of like, think about it. My house might be locked up, but if you could get into one room, so if that one room was vulnerable, you could get into that room, and then from that room, potentially get into the entire house. So you pivot from that room into the house. That's the same thing with software. You find one vulnerability, you can get to other ones from that point. It says the goal is privilege escalation. Get access, you know, root access or domain access. And the last bullet, which is a good one, they must rely on persistence to continue to probe for weaknesses. You know, I think that is the one area people are missing out. Uh, a prime example, years ago, when I first started teaching this stuff, mid-2000s, I would have students who would literally come up here and spend the entire weekend. They'd come up on a Thursday, they would literally spend the weekend, and would never give up. Nowadays, I'm not saying it's any of you, but now yeah, I get students, oh, if I spend five minutes, spend three hours. It's like, seriously? You know, my stepdaughter is a prime example. <laughs> Funny story. I taught all the kids how to change oil. Don't know how to change oil in the car? Oh, yeah. Okay. Don't know how to rotate tires in the car? Okay. Well, they all had done both of the jobs. Well, they, uh, I asked Bethany to go change the oil. And she goes, well, what do I, I said, well, you need to jack up the car. I said, okay. Because I don't know how to jack up the car. What do you mean you don't know how to jack up the car? Says, you've done that. She goes, yes, I've jacked up the car to rotate the tires. I've never jacked up the car to change the oil. So I was like, seriously, I was like, no, you didn't tell me that. <laughs> but that's the mindset. You don't, you know, you, you know one thing, you don't realize, hey, wait a minute, something I did over here could possibly help me do something else. 
you know, it's a funny story, but it's true. It, and it really happens. You know, it's persistence is a big deal in this time, in this job. It takes a very long time sometimes. Okay. Enterprise data theft. Uh, there's a book out there called Ghost in the Wire from Kevin Minnick. If you haven't read it, you need to read it. I might have a copy if you want to borrow it. Really, really, it's, it's such a good book. If you started reading, you would probably want to read it until you finished it. Like, it's that good. It's really, it's a page turner. Talks about, you know, he really didn't steal anything of value, but he did it just to do it. So it's really interesting. Okay. Personal data we can steal. Credit card numbers. We can do identity theft. I've had, who's had their identity stolen? Anybody but me? None of you all yet? And I've had credit cards stolen. I've had everything stolen. It's crazy. But your life still goes on. Okay. Practicing data privacy, or as some people say, privacy. So is it really privacy or privacy? Yes. What now? Just matters on how fancy. Yes. This is privacy. Okay. So practicing data privacy and security involves understanding what privacy is and its risks, as well as ways to keep them safe. Okay. It's kind of the reason we're having these weird tornado drills, it's to keep us safe. But we also got to do the same thing with our data. Okay. What is privacy? <laughs> that was some show and they kept talking like that. It was driving me crazy. And then there was some cooking show where they kept saying something really weird like that. It was, okay. So, privacy is a state of condition of being free from public attention to the degree that you determine. Okay. I work for a public school, so what does that mean? Are all of my records viewable to the public? Freedom of Information Act, pretty much. If you had a reason to, you could get anything. If you did a, what's it called, FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, whatever that request is, you could request something and get it. You can go online right now to open books and see my picture. Everyone I've ever gotten is on there. Yeah. It's scary stuff, but that's one thing. Okay, it was kind of like when I was in the military. I knew exactly the amount of money that everybody I worked with made. Because in the military, every rank makes a specific amount based upon the years you've been in. So if you told me you were in E6 and you're in you know, 18 years, I knew how much money you made. But boy, I'll tell you what, Rose State and every other civilian organization, you can get fired for asking someone what they make. That's crazy stuff. That's, it is. It's, it's, well, the reason is, I, I think, um, okay, Quinn, maybe I'll hire you. No experience. Day one, so I hire you at 20 bucks an hour. But then they got Alex, who's got four years of experience, so I hire him at 40 bucks an hour. You do the same thing. But how are you going to feel if you, if you know Alex is going to pay twice as much? Um, I mean, he's been working here four years. It doesn't matter. matter. He's going to pay twice as much. Well, I still don't know if that's fair. It's, it is. But I, I, it is. I, just, I think it's a federal law that you can't fire someone for asking their their fellow employees how much they can write down on a piece of paper that you fired somebody for asking. Yeah. It's, it's just like, hey, you can't, that can't be public. I can fire you because it's my yeah. yeah. I don't like to shut you away. Yeah. <laughs> as long as but it's down, it just, down. it's weird the way it works now. You really can't ask people. I don't know. It's, there's a big disagreement amongst faculty in this building last week. Mm -hmm. so. That's part of my, part of my job. And one of the fact that the member was actually complaining because of the money I make. What that faculty member doesn't understand is I'm a 12 month, yeah, I'm a 12 month employee. So if you take a normal faculty salary, divide it by nine, that's how much they get a month, because I work nine months a year. Multiply times 12, because I work 12 months a year, that's my actual salary. So I'm getting the same rate. I just work three months of the year, but the fact that you couldn't understand it. No, but you're getting paid more. I'm like, I work 12 months. I'm like, yeah, you get paid for sick leave over summer. But part of you don't understand, I'm working over the summer, you're not. <laughs> but it becomes an issue. And you know, we talk about privacy of our data, and it's the same thing. We should keep it secure to an extent. Now, in the military, 
they kind of go anal above it, you know, the whole confidentiality, you know, you know a secret, top secret, that kind of stuff, because there's a need for it. Real estate, not quite so much. But you guys ever heard of the Clean Desk Act? There's an act for it? I know it's policy, but... Well, when does policy... Well, okay, policy. Okay, then yes. Yeah. You ever see my desk? It's a mess. <laughs> it's a mess. <laughs> but... I actually went and read that policy recently, and there's nothing blatantly out there with data that shouldn't be released. That's just, yeah. So, all right. So data could be sold. Um, a prime example of that is Google. What do we pay for Google? Nothing. What do we pay for Facebook? Nothing. What do we pay for all those companies? Our personal information. Yeah. Our lives. Yeah, that was a... I was talking to Stephanie this morning, and we had a, a disagreement over Amazon Prime. She was saying that Amazon Prime, we all, everyone have Amazon Prime? Okay, so yeah, she, she was saying that Amazon Prime is no longer free two-day shipping unless you spend over like $50. I said, no, it's still free. Now she gets money. Well, over the weekend, I bought something for $34, free two-day shipping. Then I bought something yesterday. I bought something for like six dollars. I bought something yesterday for eleven dollars. The only item I bought, free one day shipping. So she didn't believe me. So I showed it to her this morning. What I did is I bought a new insole for my shoe. So, but it relates to this. So I told her. So I showed to them exactly what I bought. So she logged into her Amazon account, and sure enough, it was free one day shipping. So I kind of blew her out of the water. But I told her, you know what's going to happen now? Does she search for an insole? She's going to see advertisements. Because every time you search for something, they sell that data. Because, you know, everybody's going to sell insoles for her shoes now, even though she doesn't need them. Like, um, when I scheduled my A-plus test, yeah. um, like, 10 minutes later on my phone, I got an ad for uh, test vouchers. Nice. Because they sell, response. you know, I mean, if you read the terms of service for all these companies, they all tell you they sell their data. Do we, do we, we have a business? Why not? We always read the terms of service. Yeah. We always click agree. No, we just click agree. We scroll down and click agree. So, all right. I say, who sell the data to interested third parties? It's valuable. And they're finding out by having targeted ads and like the way Google does it and Facebook, people are spending more because of that. Does anyone ever click on an ad? Yes, you do. You just don't do that. There's something you clicked on at some point or another. You know what I think is the most, what's the word for it? Things that draws you in so much. You watch videos now, then immediately another video. So it's like in Facebook, the next video comes up, and then and you're like you can be sitting there watching. Yeah. I watched some video. I was watching, what was I watching today? A video of, oh, a video is coming up here in a minute. Okay. I'll put it on here. I watched that video. I not even realized I watched four more videos after that because it's like, oh, this one looks good. Oh, that one looks cool. And that one looks cool. And that. So it, it draws you in. Okay, we're going to get there in just a second. Okay, so risk associated with the use of private data. It says individual inconveniences and identity theft. We know about that. Associations and groups, with groups, I'm sorry. Maybe, um, what, what do we always see about all these political candidates? Oh, they remember such and such years ago. Um, I watched a movie, The Best of Enemies, or Between, Between Enemies or something like that. The black guy and the white girl. Turns out he's the head of the KKK and, you know. But the point is, association with groups means something. What would happen if, I'm not saying this is true, you looked on my Facebook page or my Twitter account or my Instagram account, and all of a sudden saw that I was affiliated with um, ISIS, for instance. I mean, that would be a bad thing. So, you know, association with groups is a big deal. And also statistical inferences. Now, uh, something statistical here. I went to uh, the doctor today to have a procedure done, and they were scheduling it. And my doctor told me, oh, while you're there, get a pneumonia vaccine. I guess. Because my doctor from Dinker called me and told me to get one. 
So I walked up to the immunization clinic today. So I even asked him, I just, I should just walk up there to get it. So I went up there and the guy's like, do you have a prescription? I'm like, no, my doctor told me to come up there. Only if you're over 65. 65 and above, you can just walk up. Under that, you need statistical, I mean, you need a prescription. So that brings into this point, statistical data. So why is it free for 65 and over? Probably because pneumonia is more of an issue for them. Okay. So statistics is a big deal. You know, pertains to everything. Risk can lead, uh, have led to the concern by individuals regarding how their private data is being used. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, they talk about some of the laws here. HIPAA, you all know what HIPAA is? Sarbanes Oxley, Gremlin Beach Act, uh, PCI. You ever know what PCI is? Payment card industry, that's your credit card companies. They have to be PCI compliant. They have to be scanned four times a year, and it's a real pain in the butt. But there's a lot of rules and regulations that manage all this. Um, I actually learned of one today. This building, we do not have an economic, economic impact study done on this building. Do you know why? This building was built in 1972. Before any building that can be built, you must have an economic impact as of 1973. Since the building was built a year before that requirement went in, we do not have one. So, I mean, that's the way laws are. You know, what, you know I'm a lot older, I'm older, I'm probably adding all your ages together, that's probably me. But um, when I was 17, it was legal to drink when I first joined the Air Force, okay? Then they changed the law to 18. Well, I was grandfathered in. Then you changed it to 20. I was grandfathered in. Then you changed it to 21. I was grandfathered in. Okay. So laws keep changing, and you know, they still let people. Same thing. Anyone here have a motorcycle license? None of you are probably old enough. But in Oklahoma, in the past, you did not need a motorcycle license. You only need to get a motorcycle. Yeah, but you did not need one at all in Oklahoma before. You could just get one. But I don't know when, years ago, they changed it when you needed one. But if you had a license in Oklahoma, on your next renewal, you just tell me I'm motorcycle. But if you didn't add it then, then you have to take the test and everything. So I said, yeah, I did not like get on one, so it's kind of handy. But were those in Midway for motorcycle license? Did you have like nine-year-olds driving? No, no, no. It was 14, but you could just get one. There was no special test. So when you got your driver's license, it was for car and motorcycle. Oh, okay. Yeah, now there's a special test for motorcycle. By the way, if you ever plan on getting a motorcycle license, Go to the class. There's a two-day class. It's not very expensive. My son, who had driven motorcycles forever, was really pissed at me. He didn't want to go to this darn class. He went to this class. He, day one, he loved it. He goes, oh, my God, that's the coolest class I've ever been in. You ride motorcycles all day. They teach you things like, you know, how to stop with just the front brakes or just the back brakes or how to do these weird – so he loved it. He said, that was the coolest class he ever been to. By going to the class, you don't have to have the motorcycle test either. So, oh, it, I'm telling you, that class, I, I went to it in the military. I thought it was amazing. That's what I told him. He was like, I've been driving all that, blah, blah, blah. And he finally went, he was okay, fine, it's fine. So, he really enjoyed it. But, uh, but these, there's lots of laws out there. And you think these are all we're ever going to see on laws? No. I went down for a sleep study. I don't know if you all have done a sleep study before. Um, I guess it's probably covered by HIPAA, but I will. But I had to fill out all this paperwork. And like four copies, it was like four different forms, all asking for the same thing. And after the first two, I just said, see other forms, and just turned it in. I'm like, this is a bunch of garbage. But they're always changing, and you know, something will happen, some case will come about, and we'll get a new law. So here, you know, proper labeling of data, ensure data is destroyed. There's just all kinds of new laws. Do you really think we cared about destroying data 50 years ago? The original Privacy Act of 1974 required that something with a social security number, a piece of paper with a social security number, had to be ripped into four pieces. That was it. So if you took an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, wrote a social security number, and I ripped it into four pieces, what's the idea that going to hit the social security number? But that was considered proper destruction of personal data. So things change all the time. Okay. So techniques for mitigating and determining attacks, they talk about creating a secure posture, selecting and configuring controls, hardening and reporting. Oh, we're almost out of time. Okay, we're almost done here, almost done. Okay, um, secure posture said, the approach, philosophy, or strategy regarding security. By the way, if you ever do this for a living, 
It won't be just you, unless you're a teeny tiny company. There will be a lot of people involved. Baseline configuration, you know, figure out what you currently have, build upon from there. Remediation, how you're going to handle it if it happens. So just lots of stuff in here. These four words, you're going to see it in this class. You're going to see it in pretty much every class. You should have all remember these. And it is not CIA. A lot see that last one, safety. Sometimes you see without that. Sometimes you see non-repudiation. But still, the top three, confidentiality, integrity, and availability are the three biggies. You'll see, and I can guarantee you they're in the crypto test. So don't miss those there. But these are selecting the appropriate controls, what you need to do. Okay. Uh, configuring control security cameras. I tell you, that is one area that is changing so fast. I mean, my security cameras now at home, obviously, they're all, you know, night vision now. It can tell me when people are at the door. It can even tell me who's at the door. It can tell me if Bethany just got home. You know, to find me if it's an animal, if there's motion or sound or what part of the picture. It's just crazy the amount they're doing. Security guards, that's another thing. You know, depending on your organization, maybe Tinker. You know, um, June 1st and 2nd, you all see what's happening in Tinker? It's the new whatever. It's the air show thing. So they can open the gates up for two days, anybody. Then they're going to lock the gate back down again. That always baffles me. You're going to let in anybody for two full days. Then what happens at the end of the two days? How do you get those people out? So what if they got Alex over there that's a bad guy? He could go hide somewhere for a month in the back somewhere. I, I just think it's crazy. But oh well, that's what they're doing. Okay. All right. Let's see. We're almost done. Firewalls. Let's look at the last bullet there. Firewalls can configure to fail safe or fail open. Think of it like the doors. If I'm at Walmart, they have electronic doors and they fail, in other words, power failure, what would you like them to do? Fail open or fail secure? Probably, I mean, at a Walmart, probably opens. Fail open so you can get out. Now, what if you're running a bank? You would probably want to fail secure. Plaza. Unless you're running Nakatomi Plaza, then they fail open. Remember that last? You seen again? You haven't seen Die Hard? Yeah. Die Hard One, yeah. Nakatomi Plaza, at the very end, the FBI cut the power. Oh, uh, okay. yes. That, watch it every year, don't you? It's Christmas, bro. Okay. All right, but fail open, fail secure, kind of a big deal. Okay. Type the third one now. Fail safe locks automatically lock. You know, if you have people involved, that could be an issue. All right. Hardening. And protecting accounts, disabling unnecessary accounts, disabling unnecessary services, I, you know, closing ports you don't need, protecting management interfaces. And we're almost done. Reporting. Set alarms. You know, the notifications on my phone, you know, I love them because I can tell, you know, when the mail lady comes to my door and everything else. Um, but what about these notifications here? Too many wrong passwords. You know, auditing is what takes care of all that. Kind of a good deal there. Now let's talk about data sensitivity. This is the last section. Okay, how sensitive in your is your data? It should be labeled with that. And here's the labels: confidentiality, private, proprietary, public, personal information, protected health information. Just lots of data there. And what should you do with your data when you're done with it? I put a link to a video here. Seriously. See if I can get that video. This is the video that took up two hours of my day. This is just how you can sh shred a hard drive. Check that out. Isn't that amazing? Just drop your drives in and it shreds them. I don't know why we got the sound on there, but. It, it probably should anything, but that one's for hard drives. Isn't that amazing how small it makes them? The bad thing is there's a 15-minute video after this one, which I had to watch after that. But uh, <laughs> it was how to make your own shred. It's kind of interesting. Okay. But you can wipe your data. You can decouse it. You can shred it. You can do pretty much whatever with it. Okay. And we are literally out of time. Any questions on chapter 13? If not, I'm going to stop the recording and you guys are free to go.